Mick, so I've got to start off with China. So Evergrande we've been watching for a sure. while. The Chinese education uh, tech sector, all the developments over the weekend, where does this story go? And I suppose, does this change this idea that once the regulatory headwinds are over, the growth story for Chinese stocks is really very excellent still? I, I think the latter point is very valid, actually, that most of these issues that we're seeing so far, you mentioned Evergrande, you mentioned the China education, they seem to be quite isolated. So, uh, you know, on Evergrande particularly, it seems very specific to that company. And for the China education sector, again, the regulations, if you look at the breadth of what has come out over the weekend, uh, some, some of the points are obviously very, very specific to the education space, but uh, other topics that investors are worried about, such as references to the VIE structure, or uh, the, the, you know, the asking these education companies to go non-profit. These are some things that investors can, are worried that could extend to uh, spaces beyond the China education. But we do think that this uh, you know, should be seen as something that's very particular to the education sector. And in that sense, uh, again, if you start to see these regulatory headwinds kind of slow down a little bit, you would realize that the growth prospects of the China internet space over the longer term still remains quite strong, given how low the penetration penetration rates are for many of these services. So last time we were, last week we were talking about the downside uh, impact on China tech. Now we're talking about education. Isn't the worry now that th this really indicates that Beijing can do anything it wants with any sector if it feels like the way that that sector is operating is not aligned with its strategic or, or, or social policy interests? Uh, so there's, there's two points to this, right? First of all, you have to uh, admit that pretty much any government can become interventionist in, in the private sector if they choose to do so. In China, this has always been the case. So investors have always worried about regulation, about the stance of the government. And investing in China has been, uh, you know, partly inclusive of these concerns. So if you look at the China internet space, for example, in terms of relative valuations versus the U.S. internet space, it's trading at the deepest discount that we've ever seen. So, you know, Coming from uh, 2011, 2012, when uh, Chinese internet stocks were actually trading above U.S. internet valuations, now it's down to 0.65 or 0.6 times the valuations of the China internet of the US internet stocks so there is there, there is uh, investor concern about these issues you do see that uh, you know price into valuations uh, mm. already so the question really is what happens going forward and, and whether the you know current valuations sufficiently discount the risk as we are seeing them right now uh, what about broader Asia? Because this GTV chart on the Bloomberg mix are now showing that earnings estimates are at record highs that we haven't seen in years when it comes to broader Asian companies. Do we have more room for upside given uh, how we've underperformed other regional benchmarks? Right. So we did a deep dive on earnings last week, and the conclusion is this, that on an aggregate level, earnings are still trailing macroeconomic outcomes. So uh, all the macro variables that typically tend to drive um, you know, earnings in Asia, you are seeing that earnings are still have some room to catch up to those outcomes. So based on our estimates, we're seeing about a 35 percent EPS growth this year, followed by about 12 percent, 10 to 12 percent EPS growth next year. So that should bring forward EPS by the end of this year to above $60 for MSCI Asia X Japan. Uh, and, uh, you know, pricing that in, uh, you know, I would say that the market still has some room to go on the upside. Mm. Uh, now, obviously, if you look at valuations right now, valuations everywhere are relatively elevated. Uh, but if you look at where they stand relative to earnings revisions, uh, I would say that valuations in Asia are actually currently fair. And they haven't been fair for a long, long time. Uh, so that's definitely a positive when you look at markets here. But given that we continue to see the Delta variant spreading, where do you go? Do you go into reflation trades or do you take safety in, say, some of those growth stocks in East Asia that are perhaps not the Chinese right. ones, but South Korea or Taiwan? Right. So I would say that the answer is actually somewhere in the middle where you go with momentum. Uh, so this is, this is a combination of several things, right? First of all, uh, the business cycle has gone from early cycle to mid-cycle. And in mid-cycle, it's really momentum stocks that do the best. Uh, secondly, you're seeing a spread of this Delta variant, which will probably put some pressure on reopening trade, at least for some time before we start to see that picking up again. It's already happening in developed markets. It will probably come to Asia at a slightly later stage, and that'll happen too. And in terms of bond deals, they've been stuck since the FOMC in June has kind of muddied the 
Fed's mm. reaction function. And we think that we will get clarity on that by the September FOMC. So uh, by that time, you will start to see value start to outperform again. But in the interim, it's really momentum right. stocks that should continue to do well. So focus on momentum, focus on earnings revisions. That's what we're looking at. Many of the thematics currently fit into that space, like decarbonization, localization, uh, you know, uh, automation, as well as right. semiconductors.